You've seen that Buddha image on the other side of the bed, where the Buddha seems to be counting something on his fingers. And it's symbolic of one of the basic ways he taught. He would teach things in terms of lists. And there are two qualities that tended to show up in many of his lists, shame and compunction. They form a list of their own, where the Buddha calls them the guardians of the world. It's because of shame and compunction that people behave. Otherwise, he said, they would be like animals being promiscuous. The two qualities are also listed in the five what are called strengths of a tr person in training. In other words, the strengths of someone who's seen the Dharma eye or given rise to the Dharma eye, that first taste of awakening. And this is a quality that gets, gets built into that person's character from that point on. They're listed as treasures. They're listed as the protection around a fortress. And the Buddha's image of the practice like a fortress have the encircling road and the encircling moat. The two qualities are mentioned so often together, shame and compunction. And because shame is such a controversial issue in the West, we spend a lot of time explaining it, how there is such a thing as healthy shame to the point where compunction gets put off to the side. The Pali word otapa is closely related to atapa, which means ardency. But it's not just ardency, it's a sense of seeing the dangers that come from unskillful behavior, and having a strong sense you don't want to cause any of those uns un unskillful things, and so you put forth the effort to prevent yourself from doing that. It's a difficult term to translate into English. One translator has recommended moral dread, which is pretty dreadful. It's good to think of the opposites of compunction, one of which is apathy, where you really don't care. You don't have the energy and you don't want to put forth the energy. to think about what the consequences of your actions are going to be. There's callousness, which where you don't care about other people, what their feelings are. And then there's defiance, where you're sick and tired of having inhibitions on your behavior. And then you'd like to be able to just free, be free to act in whatever way you wanted to. It's one of the reasons why people enjoy seeing people in power who are basically acting against the interests of ordinary people, but the ordinary people take some vicarious thrill in seeing someone who's uninhibited. Their idea being if they had power, they could be defiant too. But that kind of behavior leads to a lot of harm. And some people say, I don't care about other people. I'm tired of caring about other people. But the Buddha is making the point that you think about other people, it's going to be good for you. You care about other people, it's going to be caring for yourself. It's not just you're putting out effort for them, for them, for them. It's basically for you that you take care. He teaches this in several places in the canon. There are some stories about when he's on his alms round, he sees little kids harassing animals. In one case, the kids are fishing, in another case, they're beating a snake with a stick. And he asks them, do you like pain? And no. Then why are you causing pain to another animal? And he goes on to speak in terms of the principle of karma, that the harm you do to other people is going to come back at you. And as he said, it'll chase you down even as you run away. It's that persistent, that insistent. There's another case where he's talking to a king. He points out that you can search the whole world over, and there, you would never find anybody that you love more than yourself. But then from that he comes to an interesting conclusion, that you should never harm anybody or cause anyone else to harm. 
because after all, they love themselves just as fiercely. And if your happiness depends on harming them or getting them to cause harm, they're going to do what they can to destroy your happiness. Then there's a simple principle of empathy. You realize there are certain things you don't like to have done to you. Well, other people feel the same way. So in these ways, the Buddha is teaching empathy as the alternative to callousness, apathy, defiance. When you realize it really is in your own self-interest to take care. Now that requires energy, and this is why we practice meditation. Because there's some forms of putting yourself out where you feel depleted, and other forms of putting in energy where you get more energy back. And meditation is one of those. So when you're beginning to feel empathetic or don't care, it's a time to meditate. Here again, it's a principle of looking after yourself and looking after others at the same time. That, the Buddha said, is the most skillful way to look for your happiness. In this case, you train the mind to be with one object. And you look after the conversation that's going on in the mind and whatever it's saying that's going to pull you away from the, from the breath. You just learn how to put it aside. Whatever complaints it has. This is where you can use your term, I don't care. I don't care about the complaints. I'm just going to keep doing my work. And if the results seem to become coming slowly, you say, I don't care about that either. I'm going to do my work until the results come. Because we live in a world where we've had to learn a lesson that you can't expect things to come your way right away, and you're not necessarily entitled to things coming away before you've put out the effort. There was a time when John Sowett was teaching in Massachusetts, and after a couple of days he turned to me and said, You know, you notice how grim these people are? He looked out across the room and he was right, they looked very grim. Then he went on to add it. It's because they haven't had good practice in generosity and virtue. Now the training in generosity and virtue teaches you, to begin with, that you have to give before you're going to get. And it's teaching you at an age, if you're learning this when you're a child, at a counterintuitive me message that happiness comes from giving. Happiness comes from putting yourself out. Energy comes from putting yourself out. From thinking about the results of your actions rather than thinking about what you would feel like doing. We think of the Buddha as a defiant person, but there was one principle that he learned to respect, that he would bow down to, and that was the principle of, of causality. That when you act in certain ways on certain intentions, the results are going to be bad. Think about his teachings about how you cause harm to yourself and how you cause harm to others. You cause harm to yourself by breaking the precepts. You cause harm to yourself by giving in to greed, aversion, and delusion. Now we think about breaking the precepts as harming other people, because after all you're killing them or stealing from them, lying to them. But he says, no, that's where you're harming yourself. If you want to harm other people, you get them to do these things, because then that becomes their karmic load. So think in terms of cause and effect. and be willing to submit your preferences to that principle for your own good. And that way you get the protection that comes from compunction. As I said, the word otapa is very similar to atapa. And atapa, as you remember, is 
in the practice of mindfulness, that's the wisdom faculty, where you're wise enough to see. If you want happiness, there are things you've got to do. And if you don't do them, the happiness is not going to come. We tend to think of wisdom and intelligence having to do more with book learning. But from the Buddhist point of view, it's the realization you've got to put yourself out. You've got to put forth an effort. Sometimes you don't feel like doing it, but why give in to your feelings? Where are they going to lead you? And you've got to think about the long term. And so you make some sacrifices, but then you get repaid. Because that's the message over and over again. You help other people, you're going to benefit. That's the image of the, the acrobats, or the opposite of the image of the acrobats. That sutta, which talks about how looking after your own mind, you're helping other people. But then it goes on. Without, an, unfortunately, it doesn't have an image. They go with the other principle, which is in looking out after other people, you benefit. You develop qualities of goodwill, which are going to be good for you. Qualities of kindness, which will be good for you. Patience and equanimity. These things are all good for you. They, these become your perfections. They become your treasures. They become your protection. Because the good qualities you build in the mind, they don't go anywhere else. They stay with the mind. And that's the paradox, that the, the goodness you leave behind in the world is the goodness that goes with you, the goodness that you try to grab to yourself. In other words, the pleasures you try to grab to yourself leave you. But the goodness you leave behind, that goes in the mind. It becomes a quality of the mind that stays with you for a long time. So you have to ask yourself, what do you want to take with you? Well, develop those good qualities. And then particularly, as the Buddha starts with, always with generosity. Being generous with your time, being generous with your energy. Because realize that, that you're the benefit of other people's generosity. You remember what the Buddha said, stingy people can't get their minds to concentrate. Stingy people have no way of getting and gaining awakening. You have to look at for that part of the mind that's willing to share, happy to share. At first it may not be all that willing, but as you do it again and again, there does come a sense of self worth. And that becomes a source of happiness, a source of self esteem. The kind of self-esteem that doesn't have to compare itself with other people, but it's just good in and of itself. Those are the kinds of values you want. The self-esteem that has to compare itself with others, that's not the Buddha calls conceit. And although there are healthy forms of conceit, the part that goes around comparing, and Chan Mahabhu has a nice phrase for him, he calls it the, the fangs of ignorance. So look for goodness inside that doesn't have to compare, a sense of self-worth that doesn't have to compare. If you're going to compare, just compare yourself with where you are now with where you used to be. Realizing that the extent to which you submit to the practice, you benefit. The extent to which you have a sense of compunction, you benefit. So try to develop a, an appreciation for this quality, because it is for your long-term welfare and happiness.